There's no day that you don't help me out You have promised you won't let me down And yes, you are real, I'm not dreaming You are the one for me, my love I've seen you here I'm not dreaming You are the one for me, my love Yes, you are real You are so real You are the one for me, my love I've seen you here Over again We trust you Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for the privilege which you have given unto us to gather before your presence again this evening. We are about to hear your word. We ask that you open our eyes to behold the wondrous things that are contained in your word. Father, grant us a willing spirit as we hear to be doers of the word. Father, we ask also for the grace to wholly and totally, O oh God, be subject unto your authority. Anything whatsoever, O oh God, that will cause us to be derailed, we cancel it, O oh God. Thank you for hearing us, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, today is Tuesday the, uh, of the Holy Week, the Holy Tuesday, and uh, we have been looking at what happened during this period of the Holy Week. Uh, today, the topic we are going to be looking at is Jesus' authority challenged in the temple, the authority of Jesus being challenged in the temple. And we are going to be taking our text from Mark chapter 11, 27 to 33. Mark chapter 11, 27 to 33. And they came again to Jerusalem as he was walking in the temple. There came to him the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, and say unto him, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one question and answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from, my, from heaven or from men, answer me. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, they fear the people, for all the men counted John that he was a, a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, we cannot tell. And Jesus answering said unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Praise the Lord. On Sunday, we observed and celebrated the Palm Sunday. Uh, that's the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as a king and as a messiah. He entered into the temple and had survey of things there. And in the evening, he returned to Bethany, 
as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he went straight to the temple. And because of evening time, he made a survey and looked around what was in the temple and how things were. And after which, when the evening came, he retired to Bethany, to, this, to the house of his friends of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And yesterday, we also gathered here. We saw that it, that was Holy Monday. Jesus returned to the temple again. And this time, he saw people trading and exchanging money in the temple. Yesterday, we, said Jesus, we saw Jesus cleansing the temple. That was the topic we dealt with yesterday. He chased them away and upturned their tables. He caught their remembrance to what Isaiah said. After he had chased them away, after he had upturned their tables, then he brought their remembrance to what Isaiah said. In Isaiah 56 verse 7, he said, My heart shall be called of all nations. They had the house of prayers. Rather, you have turned it to the house of thieves. The church of God should be called and is called a house where people pray, where people come to worship. But in this instance, the temple, people now started making merchandise of the temple itself. People that, were, that had come for the Passover feast now began to buy things at exorbitant prices. I am sure that people will also be selling to them at exorbitant prices. They will exchange money at higher rates. They will buy things they will use for sacrifice at exorbitant pr uh, prices. Which means the priests, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the city, we are part and parcel of this secretarian. They were part and parcel of it. And if they were part and parcel of it, we cannot begin to understand why the real temple worship has been abandoned. And in a situation like that, you begin to see all manner of people that will bring their wares there, both the original and the fake, and they were all exchanging it. And that is why Jesus said, this house has been said to be a house of prayers. But we have now converted it to the den of thieves. So it became the den of thieves. So verse 18, the Bible says, when Jesus said this, that the scribes and the chief priests had him and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. You see, the same chief priests, the same scribes, the same elders of the town, they were there. Jesus did not say it, closing his mouth. He said it openly, and they had Jesus make, make, uh, make that straight friends. And the Bible said because they had him, they now started to find a way to kill Jesus. They went to lay hand on him in order to destroy him. Why? Because they say that the people have now started to follow Jesus in numbers. And the place we read, he said the people now, we are so much astonished at the doctrine of Jesus. If you read the NL NLT, he said the people became very enthusiastic to the teaching of Jesus. So they were finding a way in order to discredit Jesus, in order to kill him. He said, if we leave this man to continue in this manner, they will not drag all people away from us and will become useless in this society. And our merchandise will come to naught. They now began to become very daring in order to kill Jesus. Then from our text today, it is recorded that Jesus again, that is today, the Holy Tuesday, after the evening of the first day, the Bible recorded that he went out of the city, and the, the second day, that is the, uh, the, the Holy Tuesday, that he returned again and went to the temple. And the Bible says, as he was walking through the temple, the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, they had not become more daring. They are not determined that this man must die. And the Bible says, when he returned on that day, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes aggressively confronted him. Why? Why did they confront him? Number one, Jesus had violated 
the system of their religious regulations. The way they do things in the temple, the way they organize themselves, the ceremonies they observe, if at all they were observing anything, they saw Jesus having violated it. So now they became aggressive when they confronted him, when he now came into the temple on that holy Tuesday. The second thing is that he did not conform to their institutional religiosity. You know, that is, they now began to say, you are not a scribe, you are not uh, a chief priest, you are not uh, a Pharisee, you are not a Sadducee. Where do you belong to? Those institutions that were there, he said, if you are not belonging, if you don't belong to any of them, you don't have any permission, you don't have any authority whatsoever to begin to do what you are doing or to say what you are saying. And they have forgotten that all powers belong unto Jesus. Jesus has authority over all things. He's the creator and the maker of all things. And I want to say severally, Jesus had told them that he is that whatever thing he's doing, he's doing what the Father has told him, he's doing what he has seen his Father do. So the only authority that Jesus is subject to is to the Father. And Jesus is not quoting any other authority, unlike them. Jesus never uh, did not quote any authority because his authority himself, more than 70 times in the Gospels, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, him, having the authority addressing them. And as he was teaching them at one place, the people said, This man's teaching is speaking and talking and teaching like man with authority, not as described. So Jesus has authority, and because of that, they did not know, or they did not, willfully did not want to uh, uh, acknowledge this. And they said, Jesus, because you don't belong to any of our institutions of our religiosity. You don't have any mandate at all to come into the temple and begin to do what you have done. And the third thing is that he did not fit to their idea of who the Messiah should be. That is the second reason why they had to confront me aggressively. They said, Jesus, we are looking for a Messiah, yes, but you that have come from this common carpenter, we know you are more than Mary. We know your brothers, they are here with us. We don't want you. We are expecting someone that will come as royalty. And when he comes, we recognize him, we know him. So when Jesus came and proclaimed, started to proclaim himself as the Messiah, they never believed it for them. It was not the idea of the kind of Messiah they were expecting to see. So Jesus did not fit in to that at all. Jesus had gained, that is the third thing to them, the fourth thing to them, Jesus had gained the, the following of great multitude of people. So Jesus throughout his ministry, three and a half years, a lot of people, each time you see, say multitude follow Jesus. And these people were not comfortable with that. So for them, Jesus must die. Because he has gained popularity so much so that a lot of people we are following him. Therefore, when they confronted Jesus, they asked him that question. One, why did you have to throw down the, the, uh, the tables to stop our business in the temple? Secondly, why did you have to make reference to us that this house should be the house of prayer and you have, we have now made it uh, uh, the house of uh, the den of thieves? And thirdly, the whole of the things we listed out there, they now had the audacity. They were, they were emboldened to come to ask Jesus and say in that place that is verse 27 of the place which we read and they said unto Jesus and and say unto him by what authority doest thou these things and who gave you this authority to do, uh, to do these things so they were emboldened now they began to question Jesus who gave him the authority? Who gave him the audacity? Because he did not belong to their system. Why must you come to begin to do all these things? By what authority do you have? Uh, do you, have, have you been given to do all these things? So you begin to see that place. It appeared to be a very, very simple question. Jesus knew what to answer. 
they were expecting a particular answer from Jesus. The motive of the asking that question, as we saw in that place we read in verse 18, is for them to lay hold on one thing Jesus will say, and say, yes, this man has blasphemed. Therefore, let us kill him, naming the dog a bad name, so that you can be able to hang him. So they had an evil motive. Coming to Jesus and were questioning him, what authority do you have? With so much audacity, with so much force, with so much aggression, and who gave you the authority to begin to do all these things you are doing? And uh, you are in the church. What is your motive for coming to church? Should Jesus come in here at this place, this time, and ask a question, or ask you, why are you here? Why do you come to church? What will you say? Jesus knows the heart and the intent of our hearts. So Jesus recognized their heart and their intent. What they had in mind by asking such a question. The question they asked was for him to make a statement that would say he has blasphemed. So that they can lay hands on him and then begin to crucify him. So that they can justify whatever action they were planning to do. So what is your own motive? A lot of people come to church for different answers, for different motives. If you ask that question, you'll be surprised. You begin to hear so many versions of the answers. And we come to church just for us to know Jesus better, like our team said this year, to grow into him more and more so that we can be people that will be qualified at the long, at the long run to enter into the kingdom of God. Then Jesus asked them another question, used a, a counter question. He said, you have asked me by what authority? And as I said earlier on, Jesus had, uh, had several encounters with these people. And he has never hidden the fact that he has authority from God to do whatever thing he, he has doing. So Jesus did not want to answer them directly. So he used the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge to counter that their question. He said, I'm going to ask you one more question. If you answer my question, then I will answer yours. He said the baptism of John, is it from heaven or is it from men? Very simple question for them to answer. But they went out to consult. After consulting, they came back to Jesus and they said, we do not know why. Because they say, if we say that the baptism of John, the baptism of John is from heaven. Jesus will ask them, why did you not now believe him? Because if they are saying, uh, and then if you believed him, John, you must also believe me. So for the fathers, they say they did not know. Which means they did not even believe John at all at all. Neither did they believe in his baptism. Neither did they acknowledge him. And they say if this baptism is from men, then we fear because John was a great prophet that these people here we stone us. You begin to see the motive of these people, their intentions. Very selfish set of people. They were only thinking about what will concern them, what will benefit them. So when they came to Jesus and said, we do not know from where it comes, they just then answered them, responded, said, therefore, I will not tell you also by what authority I do all these things. It was the close of discussion at that point. You cannot begin to imagine yourself that you're having a discussion with Jesus and weakly you don't want to believe him at all. You are only looking for a way to justify your evil actions. And at a stage, Jesus said, I am done with this. This is the end of this discussion. This conversation has entered now. And when that pronouncement was made, if you look at subsequent times, you begin to see when Jesus began to, you know, say, beware of the scribes, beware of the Pharisees, beware of the Sadducees, beware of the teachers of the world, the scribes particularly, the people that are specialists in the teaching of the law. So Jesus said, but for this time, at this moment, this discussion has come to a close. So, and they departed. The people that came to disgrace Jesus publicly, by just that simple question that Jesus asked them, you can imagine the shame with which they return back to Jesus and say, Master, we do not know 
who from where this baptism come, uh, came from. We are asked they know exactly where the baptism came. Because they have hardened their heart not to believe. So in this place, I don't know if you have hardened your heart. And the things you should be doing, you do not do them. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus Christ. So these leaders, what was their, or were their character, uh, the character, character traits of these leaders? The character traits, what are the lessons are we going to draw from their character, their attitude, in this place. Number one, they were very, very proud people. Pride. They were arrogant. They were pompous. Very proud set of people that we are the movers of this town. Without us, nothing can happen. Without us in the temple, in fact, they were both the political and religious leaders. He said the elders, the political leaders, the counselors and whoever. Then the scribes and the, uh, and the chief priests, we are the religious leaders. So people that will say, if we come to any place, if it is not us, if you don't belong to our own group, you cannot do anything, you cannot say anything. That was where they wanted to place Jesus. Because you don't belong to our group, therefore you don't have any authority whatsoever. Proud, arrogant, and pompous set of people. The Bible says that God, that God says that the proud are will fight against the proud. I will resist him. So if you are a proud person here, the Lord is cautioning you because it is not a good threat. It's not a good character. And the other thing is that they are jealous and also hateful. Let me just put it that way. Jealous and hateful. Very, very hateful set of people. They jealous Jesus because of the crowd he was pulling. They jealous Jesus because Jesus was teaching things contrary to what they were doing. And the place we took our first reading, I mean our New Testament reading, Jesus was telling the disciples, he said, look, these people, I know that they hate me. And because I know that they hate me, you that are following me, they will also hate you because you are not of this world. So as a child of God, when people begin to hate you because of your belief in Christ, do not be worried, do not be disturbed. Because Jesus said it already, that they hate me, I know. Jesus was aware of the hatred they had on him. And it was this hatred that took them to, to, to crucify him. Very, very, very big and dangerous kind of hatred. Jesus said, because they hated me, they will also hate you. Because they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Because they did not hear my word, don't be surprised that you that will follow after me, they will not also hear your word. Jealousy and hatred was their hallmark. Their trademark. And another thing was selfishness and greedy. They were greedy, they were selfish. As we said earlier on, they did not, whatever thing that, that does not concern them, they didn't want to know. You know, they were greedy that they could come to the temple of God and they converted it to a place of anyway, the trading mall or a, 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 a trading mall. Converted the temple to a trading mall because of greed. They wanted to make gain, double gain. Because that time Jerusalem was full as we had on Sunday. Because of the feast of Passover. All Jews from other nations, they came. And they now they decided to exploit them. They will now give them exchange rate that is higher. They will now sell the goods to them at a higher cost. Whether they will now take them to perform the, the feast they came for, nobody will be able to know. It's a greedy set of people. And the selfish set of people. And another thing is that uh, a total, a total disobedience to God and the, for the things of God and disregard for the things of God. They were in total disobedience to the things of God. In fact, to God. Whatever thing God commanded, they were totally disobeying it. At variance, completely at variance to those things God has said. They were also completely and totally di uh, disregard the things God say we should do or they should do. They were disobedient. They were in total disregard to what God said we should do. Then the question now is, in what ways are you challenging the authority of Christ? We have seen these people challenging the authority of Christ. In your own life, what ways are we challenging the authority of Jesus Christ? Are you a proud person? 
The question is coming to us directly now. Are you a proud person? If you are a proud person, if you are a pompous and arrogant person, no matter the level it is, know you that you are challenging the authority of Jesus Christ. Are you a jealous person? Are you hateful of your brethren, of your any person whatsoever, whether your enemy? Because Jesus said, even our enemies, we should love them. Do you hate them? You know, it is jealousy and hate that can drive so many of us to do so many things. It can drive you to begin to backbite. It can drive you to begin to, you know, backslide. It can drive you to begin to sow seeds of discord here and there. Do you know that this place, this thing is happening there? Whereas that thing is happening there because you want to just put a division. The Lord is warning us. He say, woe unto him that sows the seed of discord. Are you selfish? Are you greedy? If you are selfish and you are greedy, you are also opposing the, 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 the authority of Jesus Christ. The things you have, you are not satisfied with them. You want to gather more and more and more and you are gathering, you are not satisfied. Are you selfish anytime you say, if it is not me, let, let us scatter it. There are people like that. If you are in that kind of character, you are also opposing the authority of Jesus Christ. Are you obedient to the will and command of God? The things the Lord said we should do, are we obeying them? Are we in total disregard to the things of God? We just come to church anyhow. You see, that is the other day we were in the church. Pika was speaking concerning, concerning the ease of the society. And somebody said, are the normal thing now? Is it the normal thing? That you are living in evil. The normal thing I'm talking about, a grown-up adult. When these things are being mentioned, I'm telling you, many of us are saying it is the normal thing. That is why, after service, we still go back. Remaining the same. It is the normal thing, but it is not. Because all those things, they have reward, they have recompense. It is not normal at all. You see people come to church, they will be pressing, you know, their, their telephones. The other day, Sunday school has finished, and when my mother came in, what she was doing when Sunday school had finished, you have missed the first thing, and you have even missed this Sunday school, was to balance you are taking selfie. We have so many of them here. And things will be going on. Some people will say, no, this part of the service is not part of me. As even the preacher is coming, or one other thing is going, that is the time they will go outside the adjusting. What are they doing? Total disregard to the things of God. That is the question that is facing us this day. Are you in those things? Are you doing them? And uh, if you are doing them, the Bible is calling us, or the, our Lord is calling us to come out of those things. And there is a time for us to begin to look at ourselves. Those threats we are talking about that are making us to be at variance with what the Lord has said, that is making us to challenge the Lord. There is a need for us to begin to do safe appraisal. The place we took our Old Testament reading, I want us just to look at that place briefly. Our Old Testament reading of Lamentation, chapter 3. Lamentation chapter 3, we are going to be looking at. Uh, let us just look at from 38, verse 38. It says, Out of the mouth of the Most High proceeded not evil and good. Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. The Lord is calling us. The invitation is here again. Let us lift our hearts, our hearts and our hands unto God in heaven. So a time of safe appraisal. Many at times we just walk and we are doing things. We don't have time to reflect. Am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? So the place Jeremiah has cried and cried and cried. The people refuse to end to hear. And the Lord is asking them a question now. 
the Lord that can be able to give you good, is he not able to also give you bad? You that have refused to repent, the day of judgment is coming. And he say unto them again, why must you begin to complain for the punishment of your sins? So you are getting the full recompense of what has come to you. That thief on the cross said, why are you saying this kind of thing? He rebuked his fellow that this man has done nothing. But for us, we are receiving the full recompense of what we have done. So, and he said unto you, Jeremiah said, come, let us look at this thing again. In that verse 40, let us search and try our way and turn again to the Lord. So, are there ways that you are disobeying God and now, you know, trying to challenge his authority? The invitation is here again. In 2 Corinthians chapter, 5, chapter 13 verse 5, it says that you should test yourself if you are still in the faith. Are you still in the faith? The things that you are doing, if they put it in a scale, can it measure up to the standard of God, what God said we should do? Or are we just coming to church we are going back? The other day we say the time is not on our side. The time is fast spent, so the Lord is calling us. So in conclusion, therefore, anyway, there are consequences of all these things. If you begin to read from that uh, lamentation, from verse 42, you begin to see what Jeremiah cried about that happened to the people. That are the some of the consequences that can come to any person that are refused to do the will of God. In that 42, he said, we have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us and thou has slain thou has not pitied thou has covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through thou has met us and us calling and a refuse in the midst of the people all our enemies have opened their mouths against us fear and snare is upon us desolation and destruction my eye runneth down with rivers of water for destruction of the daughter of my people. My eye tricked down with seas and seized not without any intermission. So these were all the cries of Jeremiah concerning the state of his people. May this kind of cry not come to us in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have the time to reflect. You have the time to come to Jesus you have the time to accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. So in conclusion, how willingly and how fully do we submit to Jesus? Are there ways in which we try to ignore his authority or try to rationalize why we shouldn't have to submit to him if we truly believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Then there shouldn't, there shouldn't be any part of our lives that we will be told in serving him we should be people who love and gladly submit to his full authority that should be our mission statement at all times praise the lord let us pray all to jesus i surrender all to him i freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily that your prayer. I don't know the areas if you do safe appraisal that are not in tune with what God has says. Now is the moment again to say Lord I surrender everything to you. 
all that I have, I submit completely and totally to you. Ask the Lord to lead and guide you, even unto eternal life. Oh, to give my blessed Savior, I surrender all. in your eyes I want to feel the warmth of your embrace and I just want to dance with you my love every day where are you my darling darling oh I want to see you see you Launch your fire, darling, darling, oh, your baby's calling on you. Mm. Where are you, my darling, darling, oh, I want to see you, see you. Launch your fire, my darling, darling, oh. Your baby is calling on you Where are you my darling, darling, oh I want to see you, see you, oh Flaunt your fire, darling, darling, oh Your baby is calling on you To meet you, my darling. I want nothing else but you. I want nothing else but you. Could you please show me your face? Where are you, my darling? Oh, oh, oh. Not your fire.
the fire. One more time, sing from the fire. Now, when you sing like this, you open up your soul to be invaded by the Spirit of God. Because there's something about God. He does not resist an invitation. There is only one thing that gives his glory direction. It is only where the sacrifice is right. That's why he goes. And so, at this point, when you present your body as a living sacrifice, the fire from heaven says, oh, there is a body to consume. And therefore, God releases fire from heaven. Where is my darling, darling? I want to see you, see you. Flood your fire, my darling, darling. Your baby is calling on you. I am your baby, I am your bride. I want to see you, see you. I know you know my voice. I know you know my name I've come to see you, see you I need your purifying fire I want to feel your love I want to melt in your arms I want you to talk to me, my beloved Speak to me, sing to me the songs of the angels Let me hear the notes of seraphims I want to Pray the Holy Ghost right now Everybody, oh, where is my oh, Shout it out. Launch your fire. Your baby. Where are you, my darling? I want to see you. Three more times. Where are you, my darling? Just a keyboard. Where are you, my darling? Sing it 
out until he makes meaning to you. Make it personal. One more time. There is a generation that will seek God with everything in them. Where are you, my darling? I came with a burden to share with you. I want to see you. You mean everything to me, Jesus. Now for the last time, everybody, no music. Where is my darling, darling? Oh, I want to see you, see you. On your fire, on your fire, darling, darling. Get oh, real with yourself. No, He's hearing you. Where are you, my darling?